So now I'm back with a few opening thoughts on the Stoa Lincoln Douglas topic. The needs of the public ought to be valued above private property rights. And the way I want to divide this up is I want to recommend a few opening readings just generally for background knowledge on the topic, then recommend some readings for affirmative and negative, and then talk about some issue areas where I think you're going to want to understand the controversy, including the strongest arguments in both directions, because this is a topic that feeds into some controversies that seem like they're not that related to one another, but once you sort of have the building blocks of the controversy. I think you're going to be ready for a lot of real specific applications that might turn up. So to begin with, one of the places I think you want to begin with just general background reading, you want to look up an essay that Garrett Hardin wrote and published in 1968, I believe in Science Magazine, called The Tragedy of the Commons. And in The Tragedy of the Commons, he offered what he thought was kind of a grand unified theory of a lot of environmental problems. He said, where there is an open access common resource that is finite and a lot of people use it, there's not really a strong incentive for people to manage it sustainably. He gave the example of a field where everybody in town got to graze their cattle. And he said, there are incentives built into where people will want to enlarge their herd and they'll want to use as much of the field as possible and the field gets overgrazed and then nobody gets to use it. And he said that was almost a parable for every pollution problem you could imagine. Now, that essay by itself is not that helpful. He does get near the end and say, one of the ways that you can contain the damage done to the common resource is to define what everyone's property rights are. And that nails the nexus of this topic. But more importantly, there have been a lot of essays since then that have taken his idea, the tragedy of the commons has built into shorthand for that particular situation, which turns up over and over again in proposals for how to limit environmental degradation in various areas. But a lot of people have written essays where they refer to the tragedy of the commons and they make arguments that are a lot less tentative than his, a lot bolder than his. One I can point you in the direction of is an essay by Preston McAfee and Alan Miller, 2012 essay that appeared in the Journal of Public Economics and the title is The Trade-Off of the Commons. They say that property rights are actually a very inefficient way to limit consumption of that public good and there are much better ways and so that would be a very good affirmative, um, that'd be a very good essay for the affirmative to read, but there are plenty of people who work for, you know, very free market think tanks who've taken Garrett Hardin's essay and they've gone in the other direction and they've said, if anything, he understated the case for property rights. But if you use that as your search term, tragedy of the commons and property rights, you're going to find a lot of good reading at the beginning. And if you productively take your time understanding what his point was with the tragedy of the commons, that's going to be a good cornerstone, I think, for the topic. The second recommendation I have is a 2011 book by Michael Diamond and Robin Paul Malloy titled The Public Nature of Private Property. It's a collection of essays, and a number of those essays look as though they really kind of capture the tension between the public good and private property. I would recommend if you can interlibrary loan that book and get a look at it. I think that's very productive reading. And finally, I wasn't sure where to put this, but this is not a reading recommendation. It's an idea that I think is going to show up again and again in debates on this topic. The question of are there some things that it's just absolutely inappropriate to put a price tag on, some things to which economics is irrelevant. And there are people who will say no, economics deals with everything, economists chiefly. But there are certain subjects where we get a little squeamish when we try to bring economics into it. Richard Posner, who's a fairly well-known federal judge back in the 1990s, had a very controversial proposal that instead of having an adoption system for children, what we should have instead is we should just sell the children. Because then the ones who could outbid other bidders and get the children would be the wealthiest parents. And the wealthiest parents had the most resources and would therefore do the best job of bringing them up. And if you're like me, you hear this argument, you recoil a little bit, but he developed the argument and a lot of other people took the argument in both directions and it goes right to the heart of, are there some things that it is offensive to talk about putting a price tag on or just to talk about ownership? So that I think, if you were to read up on that and get familiar with that whole issue, I think you'd find that very useful as you debated the topic. Okay. A couple of reading recommendations that are aimed at being affirmative on the topic. There's an article that was in the Minnesota Law Review in 2005 by Brett Frischman entitled An Economic Theory of Infrastructure and Commons Management. And what he tries to clarify there is he tries to explain 
what are the things that everyone uses and everyone needs to be in good working order and therefore we take them out of being subject to private property rights and we say these things enable everybody else to enjoy their private property rights so these things are out of bounds and so that's an article that's not only in lexis but it's also i'm pretty sure in the minnesota law review digital commons if you do a search for it by article title especially if you search in google scholar then it's very easy to find I also, whenever you see a topic where one side's ground is individual rights and the other side's ground is at tension with individual rights, one of the first places my mind always goes is to Amitai Etzioni in communitarianism. He doesn't talk that often about property rights, but in an edited collection from 1998 called The Essential Communitarian Reader, there's an essay by Marianne Glendon who wrote Rights Talk, and I don't have the exact title of it, but it's the absolute rights, she puts absolute in quotation marks, property and privacy. And in that essay, she takes on the idea that property rights are absolute, and she obviously doesn't think that they're absolute, but she also puts that in the context of people's responsibilities, that community only works when people acknowledge their responsibilities. And so I think if you were to get that essay and find the moves she makes in that, I think that'd be very useful on the affirmative. And then I had this is not a reading recommendation, but this is an analogy, an analogy that I think is kind of useful and I think it's affirmative tilted. And you know that analogies, I'm sure you know, and Lincoln Douglas having a powerful, vivid analogy can be something that's very, very useful. And the analogy I thought of was being behind the wheel of a car. Cars on the streets, a car can only have one driver. That driver gets to decide the speed of the car and the steering wheel, there are regulations, but it's still the individual making decisions but the individual has a responsibility to all the other drivers on the road because we only get where we're going safe and in one piece if traffic flows. So you may have ideas in mind, strong ideas about the proper speed, about when to change lanes, but if you wanna go a certain speed and there's lots of traffic, you don't get to exercise your freedom and just plow over all the other cars. You have to accept that other cars being in your way limits your freedom. And that's something that you might get some use out of in saying that the collective good is important and overrides when they're in conflict, individual decision making. And you might even say that the collective good, when it is in any significant way endangered, actually undermines enjoyment of private property. That's kind of a perennial debate in Lincoln Douglas. But that I think is something that if you have a judge who's kind of new and needs to be taken by the hand and led through some of this, the driving analogy I think has some power to it. Now, some recommendations for reading on the negative, where I think I'd begin if I were you, is with Milton Friedman. And I think probably the reading that I would recommend is Capitalism and Freedom. I think Capitalism and Freedom is where he has the most to say about property rights. It may turn out not to be true, and you might have to do a little bit of digging to find where his argument is about property rights. He, in general, thinks that economic freedom is the foundation. It is the protector of all other kinds of freedom. So, you know, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist, fairly well respected, especially with the judges politically aligned in the way that you're likely to see in your judging pool. So Milton Friedman is a good place to begin. You definitely want to look into John Locke. In the second treatise in chapter five, that's where he talks about property rights. Everybody else who mounts a strong defense of property rights says the strong defense begins with John Locke. So spend a little time and get up to speed on how he makes the case. I think you ought to check into Murray Rothbard. If you do a search for Murray Rothbard and the term property rights, you'll find that he has a lot of very energetic, enthusiastic defenses of property rights. And then this is kind of like the analogy from earlier on, or actually it's more like the Posner issue. Are there certain things that are not economically, that's not appropriate to economize? I, I wasn't sure where to put this, but I'm gonna put it under the negative that even though it has implications for the affirmative as well, whenever you have a topic where the sides that are one, the, the different sides of ground feed into one another and they're interdependent and they make kind of a feedback loop, kind of like this one, to where if the public good breaks down, you can't enjoy your property rights. But other people will say that proper exercise of property rights and allotment and respect for property rights is the only way that the public good is maintained. Whenever they have kind of that co-constitutive relationship, you should expect there are going to be balance negatives. And it doesn't matter whether you like balance negatives or approve of balance negatives, they're gonna be out there. And what I would recommend that you do is write one and use it for practice debates to where you have almost muscle memory for the kinds of arguments you need to make if your opponent runs a balance negative. That's a recommendation you can do with it what you like. That brings us then to the issue areas, and I've broken them up into 
five clusters. Now, the fifth cluster is titled miscellaneous, so it's not really a cluster. But the clusters that I've got are real estate oriented, environmental protection, intellectual property, business practice, and then finally miscellaneous. Real estate oriented. The first thing I put down when I saw this topic was eminent domain. Now, if you're not familiar with eminent domain, you might own a piece of property and the city might come to you and say, we would like to take part of it. We are widening a highway on the edge of your property. If you'll sell us this little strip, we're gonna put another lane on this highway. We think there'll be fewer accidents. You as the property owner get to say, I don't wanna sell, I wanna keep my property. But they can then legally, under certain circumstances with certain safeguards, they can say, we are taking that property. Here's what we think is a fair price for it. It no longer belongs to you. You want to read up on eminent domain. You want to read up on Kelso and the other court decisions that have made this controversial in recent years. You want to read up on critiques of eminent domain. You want to read up on examples where eminent domain was a really good idea, and if it didn't exist, there would have been disastrous consequences. You want not to be caught off guard or unprepared if the debate turns toward eminent domain. A second issue that is sort of real estate oriented, this one I think has a little bit of a negative tilt, and that is homeowners associations. Very many neighborhoods and subdivisions in this country, if you buy property, there's a strong expectation or even a requirement that you join a homeowners association. And the homeowners association can promulgate regulations and restrictions on what you can do with your property. You cannot paint your house a certain color. You cannot have X number of cars in the driveway. You cannot landscape your yard in certain ways because the homeowners association says you can't and if you defy those then they can fine you or maybe even take you to court to try to compel you to comply with the homeowners association regulations and there's no shortage of all these horror stories of homeowners associations run amok because they tend to be run by people who live in the neighborhood or in the subdivision and every once in a while they are run by people who don't feel powerful in any other area of their life, so they make these really irrational decisions. I think it would be a good use of your time on the negative to go get a couple of good horror story homeowner association stories. I, I, that sentence you probably can't diagram, but I'm not gonna worry about it. Homeowners associations is another issue area that I think will probably surface on this topic. A third is historic preservation. There are, all over the country, there are communities where there are houses and there are, well, chiefly houses, I guess other buildings as well, where because they have historic significance, there are regulations in place that they cannot be torn down and they cannot be remodeled. And the argument there is that they're part of the cultural heritage of the community and that people need to be able to visit them, that students need to be able to study them, and there are arguments both ways. There are arguments that historic preservation is very important. It's a value worth arguing and fighting over. But then there are other people who critique historic preservation and say that it goes too far and that actually having the tangible property still in existence is unimportant if you've got all the information about it that someone could need. So be up to speed on historic preservation. A fourth is urban sprawl or urban growth boundaries. I live in Oregon, and the city I live in and a number of other cities in the state, they have a boundary around the edge of the city, and you cannot build outside of it. You can't build new housing. I don't think you can build new businesses. And that's because the phenomenon of urban sprawl, of just letting people go further and further out from the urban core so that they can have nice big yards for their houses, that particular phenomenon, it results in people having to drive further distances to get around town, which creates more air pollution and more traffic. And so cities like Eugene, Oregon, and I believe Portland has one as well, they've said, you're going to have to go for density. You're gonna to have to build within the urban growth boundary, and that's a check on urban sprawl. So that's another thing that you want to read up and understand the arguments both ways, because I think they're very likely to turn up on this topic. Finally, there's gentrification and affordable housing. Gentrification and affordable housing. Very often, neighborhoods where housing that was affordable to middle and lower income people they get taken over. They suddenly become trendy or popular, and then there's higher income housing, and lower income people get completely priced out of the market. So there are proposals in place and sometimes regulations requiring that there be a certain amount of affordable housing. New York has kind of led the way on this. They had rent-controlled housing a long time back, and there are movements now. As people build new housing units in New York, they have to set aside a certain portion of them as affordable housing. So that's a controversy you want to read up on and you want the best arguments both directions. The second cluster that I had after the real estate oriented ones was environmental protection. 
Environmental protection, I think, fairly obviously, is a huge part of this topic. I didn't list all the different environmental issues. We'd be here all day. But I said, if you're going to take that direction, which I think is affirmative tilted, then what you're going to want to do is find examples that are really, really vivid, where you can really paint a mental picture and have the judge almost shuddering a little bit. One example that I had was the Deepwater Horizon, which is an offshore drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico a few years back that had a really severe spill, and it was headline news just about all summer while they tried to get it under control. But an even better one, I think, there are a lot of people in the Midwestern United States who have pig farms. And the thing about a pig farm is it produces a whole lot of manure because pigs love to poop. And there have been a lot of incidents, you can dig around on Google and find a bunch of them, where there's been a spill. And this big thundering wave of pig poop goes sliding down the hill outside the owner's property to begin with, and it makes it into the water supply. And then, People have to be very careful. They have to boil their drinking water. They have to drink bottled water for sometimes long periods of time because there's pig poop in their water. And I think there's a little bit of tinkering and jiggling around to figure out how exactly do you make that argument? Do you say that that's not a use of private property but an abuse of private property because the manure pile got off your property? Or do you say that incidents like that are inevitable if you're going to put your property to certain uses? Okay. Actually, I just, in thinking about this, I spontaneously thought of one more. This is probably a fairly obvious one, but zoning laws. The idea that certain districts should be zoned commercial, certain districts should be zoned residential, that is an attempt to rein in the use of private property for the purpose of the public good. And I think the existence of zoning laws is fairly uncontroversial, but you'll find that there are plenty of examples, tons of examples of the application of zoning laws that are irrational. So you're going to want to recognize what are the contours of that issue and maybe have some good examples both directions in case someone turns up and that's part of their case. Okay, I just threw that in at the end of environmental protection. Really, you should put the zoning laws thing at the end of real estate oriented. So if you're taking notes off this, that's where that should go. That should go with the real estate oriented ones, not the environmental protection one. Okay, third cluster. Third cluster is different from the first two. The third cluster is intellectual property. And one of the first things I wrote down when I heard about this topic, the uh, eminent domain was first on the list, but the second thing was copyright. Because copyright originally, when the copyright laws were first written, original creative works did not have copyright protection for that long. And after copyright protection expired, they went into the public domain. And people could use those works, they could use fragments from their works in their new creative works. They could use scenes from books and make movies out of them because those were now in the public domain. They could use songs, perform songs that were no longer covered by copyright. Those were in the public domain. But there have been lobbying campaigns over and over again, Disney is behind a lot of them, to make, to make copyright protection extend longer and longer and longer. And if you go looking, there are some pretty good argument essays, some pretty good law reviews, and some pre pretty good opinion pieces in more popular press talking about how that defeats the purpose, that actually sabotages what copyright was originally meant to do. And it's important that works pass into the public domain so that we have the ability to use them for new creative work. There was a TED Talk, and I'm going to go back and dig out the name of the TED Talk presenter and put it into the annotations, because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But it was called Made to Share, and it was about how industries where there is an expectation that you're going to copy that they actually, they're a lot more profitable than the ones where they try to lock down the intellectual property and prosecute people or penalize people for copying previous creative work. Okay, so copyright extension was a first. The second one was seed patents. Patents for seeds, patents for agricultural products, which are really about a very fierce defense of one's private property rights. You know, if you're a Monsanto, I think it's Monsanto, and you are the ones who developed a particular kind of Roundup Ready crop, well, one of the ways that you make sure you get the most profit and you recoup all the costs of having developed it in the first place is that you patent it. But there are implications. A lot of times when these things are patented, it complicates unnecessarily the growing of food in ways that can actually generate hunger. So that's a controversy you're going to want to get on top of. Intellectual property protections for seeds and other agricultural products, and when do those result in hunger? Similar to that, pharmaceutical patents, patents for drugs, 
And there was a controversy a year or two ago, a guy by the name of Martin Shrelly, who acquired a couple of patents for drugs that had previously been very affordable and were important for people to stay alive. And in order for him to make a good profit off what he had just acquired, he jacked up the price of them and then was very bold about the fact, I'm here to make money. That's why I am in this business in the first place. And if some people are going to die because they can't afford their drugs, oh well, don't blame me, blame the system. So read up on that a little bit, and I think you're going to find some illustrations that have pertinence, that have salience. And you're going to want to be able to critique that system and say that it's dysfunctional, but you're also going to want to have the arguments in place to be able to defend it, to say that ownership and the ability to profit off this, that's the only way innovation happens. And there's a reason that we have so many new medicines developed here in the United States, as opposed to countries around the world, where this whole project might be only done on government resources and done with centralized planning. So you can debate that one either way and you want to be prepared to. Okay, that gets us to the fourth cluster and I put together just a couple of issue areas and labeled them business practice. And the first one was corporate social responsibility on the one hand. And you can just do searches for corporate social responsibility and there'll be essays that come up that explain what it is and why it's important. And on the other hand, the expectation shareholders have that the organization will be run to maximize profit and maximize shareholder value. And those are two ends of a particular controversy. Corporate social responsibility is almost always about what are the corporation's responsibilities to the community, in other words, the public good. And then shareholder value, that's about the shareholders own private property, they own their share in the company, and are they justified in expecting that the corporation is going to be run to try to maximize profits to them. And people make arguments both directions. You want to be on top of that. One, I guess, specific example that kind of is in line with that is Nestle. Nestle, for a number of years, has been trying to acquire and acquire more it's been trying to acquire rights to bottle and sell water as water becomes more scarce, as drinking water becomes more scarce, as there are more and more communities in the United States and even around the world suffering from extreme drought. Nestle has made some moves that are really, really kind of bold, really highly controversial. And the CEO of Nestle has said things like, you know, if we own all the drinking water and people are dying because they don't have water to drink, I don't think that's our fault. I don't think that's our problem. And there are a lot of people who have been just, just quite hot enraged by that and have developed the arguments that that's absolutely an unacceptable stance to take. And I think that's grist for this debate topic. The couple of things I lumped together and I called miscellaneous. The first one is, I believe, this is something I was reading just in the past week. I do know the state of Oregon, there's no such thing as a private beach. The coastline, the beach, is publicly owned. And I just stumbled across in reading something unrelated this week that my home state, the state I was born in, Texas, same thing. The beaches themselves are public. You can own property up to a certain distance from the shore, but the beach belongs to the public. And in the rest of the United States, what's fairly common is the beach is privately owned and people can't get to the beach. So you might look into the different direction those two states went from the other 48 and see if that's something that you can work into you know, your case somehow. I think that probably belongs, now that I think of it, back with the real estate-oriented subject areas, but who knows. And then the other thing that I jotted down was I had two more. They were both about wartime. Wartime mobilization. In World War II, there were price controls, and there was also rationing. And those were both limits on what you could do with your private property, but they were for the public good. They were for the duration of the war, so the war could be fought and won. And then I also put down wartime or emergency profiteering. Is it okay if you've got a resource that people need to respond to an emergency, is it okay for you to jack the price way up? People have certainly done so and been accused of profiteering, and that's an accusation that tends to make people very unwelcome in a community. So you might look into wartime profiteering or emergency profiteering. Sometimes the search term is price gouging, and see if you come across any good vivid examples that you can use either direction. So those are my opening thoughts for what you want to be prepared to debate on the STOA topic, and I hope those turn out to be useful.